something. Sitting to my immediate left is Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thank you, sir. And sitting 989 miles to my right is Eli Bosnick. Eli, glad to see that you survived another one. That whole death thing sounds super appealing right now. Is that like a, <laughs> can I choose that? I choose that. <laughs> death. Too late, you already watched it. And joining us for the first time is comedian, sketch actor, writer, performer at the Upright Citizens Brigade and People's Improv Theater, and special guest masochist, Keisha Zoller. Keisha, welcome to God Awful Movies. Oh, well, thank you for having me. So... I, I feel like I had to uh, have that tone because as a black woman, I have to be pleasing to white men. That's what this is. <laughs> <laughs> She's already learned the lessons that this film yeah, wanted her to know. This is why we're here. So before we get started, I'm dying to know, did Eli like save you from a wolf once and you're doing this to repay a life debt? Was this a voluntary thing? Uh, This was... uh. I mean, I, I'm not in a basement right now. I repeat, I'm not in a basement. And Eli's not keeping me captive. This is. If I can just jump in here, it puts the lotion on its skin. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, I keep, Very keep important. What were you saying? Something about bears? Dogs? <laughs> All right. So before we get started, Heath, tell us, what are we reviewing tonight? We are reviewing a movie called War Room which is the story of a mother who learns from an old lady how to overcome a shitty husband and a very distinct body odor problem using a serial killer type shrine to Jesus in her closet. <laughs> Not only is it easily the least exciting movie with the word war in the title, it's the least exciting movie about closets, as far as I can tell. <laughs> I'd say that pretty much sums it up. Now, I'm going to ask everybody, but Keisha, you're our guest, so I'm going to give you first crack at it. How bad was this movie? Well, I mean, all I will say is thank goodness white men finally explained how black women need to say black men. <laughs> I mean, I've been waiting my whole life and realizing I'm not saving enough men. That's true. I mean, that's true. You're like, Keisha, my, you're my welcome. Identity's point. <laughs> yeah. On behalf I mean, of white men everywhere. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's amazing because like it, it's, you know, black cinema really achieved something in this movie because a hundred years ago <laughs> they wouldn't have hired black actors. So. <laughs> and if you least, just watched this movie, you'd think that is the only step we'd taken forward. Um, listen, I, I mean, oh. Why why do a minstrel show when you have free black puppets? You know? <laughs> <laughs> also, at least the minstrel, I, I think I'm fair in saying a minstrel show much less offensive than this movie. Yes. Much, much less offensive than this movie. I mean, there's definitely less God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, less, yes, exactly. It, it, and I mean, the Negro spirituals are absolutely better. I think we can all agree. <laughs> oh, that. no question. Oh, in minstrel shows. <laughs> right. right. And I think it's, I mean, and again, I can't speak for you, but I think that now, now that so many black stories have been told in movies, like we've seen so many black protagonists, we've seen, especially of black women and women of color. I think that like now we're finally ready to see other stories than the, than that of women of color. Cause it's just like, all right, already we get it with black women <laughs> and your stories in cinema. Like, ugh, is it another Oscar where everyone who wins is black? You know what I'm saying? Keisha, you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for mansplaining it. Like, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, literally, and... literally, you could not have said it better. That's why I mansplained no. it for you. <laughs> I just read the book of Timothy. You're not even allowed to say it better. I know. It's Timothy, the first mansplayer. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, Heath, tell me, how the hell did this happen, this movie? Uh, well, it feels like it literally got sold in an elevator. Like, some producer says, okay, pitch me in 30 seconds. The guy says, all right. It's about a black family, and they shh, you can stop selling it. Stop selling it. It's a done deal. We're all on board. Add Jesus, we have a go movie. It's That's done. It's gold. done. You had me at it's. Yep, right. <laughs> There's so much cocaine in my bloodstream right now. We're done. And finally, Eli, complete the sentence if you would, sir. Watching War Room was like blank. Watching War Room was like bringing your casual acquaintance, Keisha, to a KKK rally <laughs> without telling her about it. 
That's what this movie experience was like for me. This was like, this was like bringing Keisha to a horror movie. Because everyone else in the theater that we were in was watching a Christian movie and they were enjoying it and talking to each other about it. But I was watching Keisha gasp and sigh in horror and despair <laughs> while everyone else in the movie clapped and cheered. Now, we're going to get into the breakdown of this flick in a minute, and I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about her. But before we even get into that, I want to talk about Miss Clara. Okay, now this is the old lady that's sort of at the center of this movie. She's not the star of the movie, but for some reason the filmmakers chose to cast an actress named Karen Abercrombie, who is a Pennsylvania Yankee in her mid-40s, to play this old Southern woman. And if I'd learned in my research that she was also a white woman in blackface, I would not have been surprised. So any thoughts on the Miss Clara accent? Do we approve? It sounded accurate to me. I don't know. Oh, right? Lord, I think it's a good-ass accent. <laughs> it sure is relatable. Yeah. Uh -huh. Accurate like that, yeah. And if you want some pie right now, I'm making pie and praying to Jesus. I think that by the, by the way that that actress chose to play that character, we really got the complexity of her journey. You know what I'm saying? I feel like it was, you know how subtle it is, like, um, you seen Daniel Day Lewis in my left foot, like how limited yes. he was, and just like the, the subtle undertones of that. I feel like she was like that, but the opposite. Yes, yes, I think you, you might have, you might have nailed it there. I just, but see, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the actress did not want to do that. They were, she was just in the audition, and 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 the and the and the white directors and and writers were going, "Can you do it a little more, Amos and Andy? Can you give us more, you know? Try it blacker. Can you do it blacker? <laughs> I don't want to. I'm trying to tell you how to do your job. It did not sound very black. Can you do it a little bit more? Like I want people, old white man pictures of black women. Right. I want you to. I want you to do this where, in a way that people will try to pour pancake syrup out of you after each <laughs> take. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'd love you to do this in a way that reminds me of my 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 home, the woman who raised me. I call her Mammy Jane. <laughs> like, do it, do it more like her. More, you know, more Mammy Jane. Now, <laughs> certainly a note in there somewhere. But now I, I will say that I watched this in a theater filled with old Southern black women, and they were eating it up with a spoon. Apparently, they also think that they sound funny when parodied to the point of overt racism. Who knew? Well, I mean, the biggest thing I think for them is Tyler Perry didn't write it. But, <laughs> uh, it, it, so they're thinking, finally, white people can relate. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm thinking, finally, <laughs> finally, Tyler Perry didn't write this because if, Tyler Perry did write this. Uh, you have to understand that the black woman would be shamed for earning more money at any point than her husband. So. <laughs> right, it's true. And she would have died of AIDS by the end of the movie. Well, so yeah. there wasn't there wasn't quite enough AIDS for everybody involved for this to be a Tyler at Perry. At least <laughs> something would have happened if somebody died of AIDS in this damn thing. All right, well, obviously there's a plenty to get to, so we're going to take a quick break to gather supplies before we set across the desert of drudgery that is War Room. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming in. Yeah, thanks for seeing us. Uh, no problem. Now, guys, before we help you make another movie, there's some issues I want to talk to about with you. All right, go ahead. Uh, well, see, here's the thing. Fireproof was incredibly misogynistic. It treats marriage mm -hmm. as yeah. some kind yeah. of holy relic that has to be upheld. Right. Yep. It's yep. racist, badly written, didn't make well. any sense. And we, we really want to avoid that in this next movie. We want to branch out. All right. We totally understand. Okay, great. Wonderful. We're on the same page. What have you got for me? Okay. It's, it's a story about an African-American family. All right, I like that. We haven't covered them yet. I like it. Go home. Right, right. And this woman is in a terribly abusive relationship with a man who is stealing and selling drugs. Conflict. I like it. Relatable. This is what I'm talking about. Real stories. Go on. Keep going. All right. And, 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 and then she realizes what she needs to do is stop being such a bitch and pray in a closet. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Yes, yeah, so she meets this magic lady... 
this old black magic lady. And she is sassy. So sassy. Yeah. And then the sassy magic Super black sassy. lady explains that the way you can get your husband to stop being cruel to you and breaking the law is to pray in your closet. Pray pray in your closet. Yep. Yeah, but, but here's the best part. We end the movie with something black people love. I want to point out I am literally afraid to ask. It's going to be a double Dutch tournament. Yeah, it is. God, guys, no, it's 2015. We are not making a movie about stopping emotional abuse with prayer advice from a magic black lady that ends with a jump rope competition. Uh, we didn't add this part, but this movie will make $15 million in its opening week. So we start filming Monday. Monday, good Monday. for you Monday guys. Yeah, that's great. I've, I've got, got a thing on early, but then I can we can start later. Right, later Monday, good. got it. After supper. All right, we're back to start the breakdown here, and I find it damn interesting that this movie starts with the sound of helicopters and explosions as though it's trying to fool you into thinking something interesting will eventually happen. <laughs> but it does not. No. Yeah, so basically this movie opens with a female Morgan Friedman Except the things that she's saying don't make any sense. I, I think the right. general thesis of her spirit first speech was every war has a strategy, which is true. That's not <laughs> not true, but it no. also doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> Just to, to clarify. And every sentence <laughs> has a period. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, my favorite line was victories don't come by accident. Uh, of course, of course no victories come by pure accident. I mean, the studio execs who greenlit this movie, um, that was an accident, but like, no. Oh no, I said no. Well, we're all out of red stamps. All right, fine. I mean, I guess we're making that movie. Isn't that the one that's super crazy racist? Yes, it is, but we are out of red stamps. All right, fine, fine. Make the movie. Yeah, and I imagined like, G.I. Joe Jesus, like, bum, bum. In, covered in fatigues. Right. Uh, I said I'd be back. under his eyes. <laughs> Judas, are you covering me? No. Fuck you, Judas. Every time. Seriously. <laughs> Again? Yeah. Matthew is yeah, crazy like eyes because he thought the world was in the end. He's like, come on, let me at him. See, now that, again... More interesting, action-packed. I'd probably uh, have a more favorable review. Yeah, I want to. GI Jesus is is good shit. We might just have to uh, we might have to start a Kickstarter to get that. Yeah, one I want to see GI no. Jesus. Yeah. Why do we have to start a Kickstarter? Let's just go to Sony right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Apparently, they're taking anything. <laughs> right, exactly. But they don't Listen, have any more red stamps. Let me go in first, so I can use uh, all the guilt and say, "Hey, why don't you give me a movie?" <laughs> right. And they'll and they'll say, "Well, we have to." Carrie Washington, and that's all they'll know how to say. That's, that's fair. You can lure them in with your lilting racist voice, and then I'll sneak yeah. in behind you and explain that I wrote the entire film, and they'll be like, "Oh, okay." As long as a, as long as a white guy wrote it, I don't want, and we don't, we don't want any black woman stories in here because. They would probably tell you how destructive religion has been to the community. No. <laughs> no. Can you imagine? Oh, let's make another movie about a white person who helps them. <laughs> yeah. uh, but let's make sure they're magical because, like, yes. black people have it hard. So, like, the only thing that saves them is magic. Literal, <laughs> literal magic. But not Gandalf magic. Like, oh, my God, I'm such a good person magic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. The <laughs> weakest fucking miracles in the world, too. Now, we'll get to that, but first we have to meet our, our heroine, um, Elizabeth, who is a busy, well-to-do real estate agent, I do believe, because they hand that to you on a fucking platter like every other plot point in this movie. Yes, she's a, she's a busy, well-to-do real estate agent for whom, and now listen, I don't know about your guys' households growing up, she is very lax with the grades for her child. Her child has a C, and she's just like, that's fine, don't worry about it. A C is not acceptable, and the very first thing she does in this movie, well, first she takes off her shoes. She takes uh -huh. off her shoes, and I would say that the... The major theme of this film, more than Christianity, God, and prayer, is that this woman's feet smell terrible. And that every- And that's hilarious. <laughs> and it's hilarious and everyone hates her for it. Her child, <laughs> this movie, her, her relationship with her daughter opens with her daughter being like, your feet smell terrible, you should kill yourself. 
<laughs> yeah. And I mean, as we know, uh, women, everything that comes out of them is like awful and horrific. So we should shame them for it. How dare your feet smell? I never smell dad's. I mean, what are you going right. to do? Bleed? I mean, <laughs> fix your humors. What are you doing over there? What's going on? God damn. Mom needs to be like leached the- again. <laughs> And just in case she wasn't bad enough, we also meet her husband, Tony, who is a uh, pharmaceutical representative. Um, or actually, he's a, he's a drug dealer because he's black, but we don't, we don't learn that early until later. Right, Spoiler. exactly. It's a, it's a surprise that the black man turns out to be a drug dealer. Yes, exactly. We were like, oh, good, good. They're not going to paint this guy as a drug dealer. Look, he's got a good job and a good career. He's a criminal. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A well, felon. but yeah. the difference is he's a like drug dealer who pays taxes, so it's fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. <laughs> as we'll learn later on, it's totally fine and has no consequences. Yeah, um, right, right, exactly. As long as Jesus is cool with but it. But just to, just to give you the level that there is not a single character, the husband is introduced – by coming in, emotionally abusing his wife for wanting to financially help her sister, which the mm. conversation they have where they're just where he's like, did you move money from a, from my savings account into the checking? And she was like, I tried to help my sister. And he's like, well, don't do it. If any of us on this recording ever talked to our wife slash relationship partner in that way. I would be talking like this because my balls <laughs> would currently be deposited through one of those little em- envelope slips into HSBC. Right now, HSBC, she would have stuffed them in there and entered my own. She'd been like, well, now that's in our checking account. Now your there balls you are in our checking account. Well, maybe, maybe you just don't get the female perspective on this. And it's really like, you're right. I'm a dumb woman who shouldn't touch or smell money <laughs> ever. <laughs> like, if I look at money, it's bad. And like, <laughs> helping people is bad. It'll burst. In. If you look at money, it'll burst into flames. And yeah. turn into tampons. Well, no, I do want to, <laughs> I do want to come to dad's defense a little bit here because if my wife took five thousand dollars out of the uh, out of the bank account and didn't even mention it, and then I like didn't later find out it was like something awesome for me or whatever, I'd be pissed. I I, I don't I, I would I would have come to her like you know, hey honey, um, you know, but I would have been in the inside. I would have been just like Tony. Oh sure, yeah, we're all Tony <laughs> on the inside, but you know, <laughs> the cop puts his knee in your back and then you stop saying that shit. <laughs> everyone's Tony on the inside. The difference between this movie and the rest of the universe is that everyone's like, hey, man, don't be fucking Tony. That's what terrible people do. <laughs> also, I I don't know where you live because it's so far, far, far away. But I'm assuming your house ain't like that. So uh 5G is probably... Not as hard yeah. for him. Yeah, if Anna as takes thirty six dollars out of my savings account, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not like you need to talk to me first. I'm like, right. did I buy more porn? I think, when does Mister Skin expire? I gotta put this in my calendar. This is on me. Oh, it's Bang Bros. Bang Bros. Got it. That was it. Never you get mind. Seventy two websites. Yeah, keep it relatable, Eli. <laughs> You have no idea how many people who listened to this were just like, yeah, bang bros. 72 episodes. You tweet at Keisha. You tweet at Keisha. You tell her. You show her your brand loyalty. I will drown you in Twitter pornography. No, don't send her porn. Just send her. Just tell her you like bang. Don't actually don't do any of this. I'm so sorry. Oh, God, I'm Thunderfoot. I'm so sorry. Oh, shit. <laughs> what have I become? I just accidentally become the Polly Lamb of the podcasting world. <laughs> I was just trying to make a point that my joke was funny. Oh, God. Here's her address and phone number. Why? Please stop. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So they have a terrible (laughs) fight to which he goes in the gym. And if we didn't think that this movie was going to apply racial stereotypes to everyone, he plays basketball with his friends 
and then does uh-huh. a backflip at their request. <laughs> There's <laughs> no more demeaning introduction to an African American <laughs> character than a white guy going, "Hey man, you got to do a backflip for me." And him just being like, "Well, okay, okay. backflip." <laughs> <laughs> seems like the it seems like the actors of this movie are almost certainly the largest group of black people the writers ever met. Oh. It seems like they had the script all set, and, you know, then somebody told them it got cast with a black family, and they had no idea what to do. <laughs> so they took these, like, occasional stabs at changing stuff like for no reason. And it's usually something wildly offensive, like, oh, he's going to do a backflip and dunk basketballs and have a crackhead sister-in-law. And, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I did find it funny that they stayed with the trope that they've established, the Kendrick Brothers and all their other movies. Apparently, even in their black cast movie, the main character has to have an offensively stereotypical black friend. <laughs> well, and I, I would just like to point out, uh, thank goodness Tony only plays basketball one-on-one with his black friend because let's never see black people playing basketball with white people. <laughs> just just taking orders. Yeah, just, yeah. just <laughs> taking orders to do tricks. Yeah. Hey, hey, Tony, hey, Tony! You gotta sit for me, bud. Okay, <laughs> now roll over. Isn't this great? <laughs> uh, white men wrote this movie. Well, but I was kind of hoping that they would go the other way, you know, maybe give him a a stereotypical white best friend named Skip or Ellsworth or something, you know, that that wore a bow tie the whole time. Oh, a stereotypical Jewish friend, Moishi. Oh, that'd be, that'd be. (laughs) I'm telling you, man, you can't let him move money out of your savings account. You'll go broke. (laughs) I'm allergic to this. That's a bench. I'm allergic. In my mind, Moshi is wearing a Jews for Jesus t-shirt. <laughs> just, just so we know it, he's still passable. His payas yes, end in yes. crucifixes. <laughs> right. <laughs> that little cross is cut into the end of his crucifixes. Again, better than the movie we watched. Yes, yes, as would anything be. Now we get a quick shot here where we see the family going to church and we see that Tony's such a dog, he's eye fucking the lady in the next pew. And I do want to say about the church, um, the church was like, I, I don't know, I, I haven't been to a lot of churches, but I've never seen one this racially integrated. So they, they can't play basketball <laughs> together, but they do sit in the in the pews together. Oh, almost every other one. It's like white person, black person. It's like when they yes, used to exactly. make you sit boy, girl, boy, girl. That's what they <laughs> yeah, obviously did with the extras there. They were like, listen, we, we had a whole big thing. Because you know the first take, they had everyone segregated. So they were like, great. So the white people on the right and the black people. And then someone was like, no, we can't do that. And they were like, really? Isn't that how churches work? No, man, that's not how. They don't sit in different chairs. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Why are there two water fountains? One's for kids, man. Come on. (laughs) I thought it was because they're taller. I I mean there's you can't have racial harmony if it isn't visualized I I think is the the point is I mean we put all the black people in the front so it seems like the cool church and then in the back it's just a sea of white people right, exactly yeah. <laughs> just all the people who got paid to be in the movie um and then we go back to to the house for more um exciting kitchen table action and get uh, get used to that guys we're going back to the kitchen table quite a bit in this movie. They shot about 60 pages at this kitchen table. Yeah. Right, exactly. yeah. Exciting. <laughs> Uh, and this, of course, has – this was my – of of the many reactions – listen, I, I can't recommend this movie to anybody who has eyes or ears or the ability to, you know, do something f- more fun like open your ball sack and pour salt inside until it's just full. Um, but if you do get a chance to see this movie with Keisha, I, this, th- it is an experience to see because this this scene contains a line where she basically – he's like – Oh, I've got to work this weekend. And she says, when were you going to tell me? And he says, I just did. And Uh Keisha went, oh, it was just a sound of, it was just pain. It's like watching a a mother lose her child. And I really recommend, if you ever want to watch someone in (laughs) just genuine pain, watch Keisha watch that, (laughs) that line interchange take place. It's really, it's really the depth of despair. And if you didn't want to watch someone in pain, why the hell would you be listening to this podcast anyway, right? <laughs> good point. Good point. Yeah, I watched that scene and I remember thinking, I was like, 
So everything's her fault. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll try at the moment she tries to assert herself at all. It's like, no, you're wrong. You're black and a woman. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and you'd think, you'd think cause that's such a grotesque scene that later on the movie will revisit it and we'll be like, oh, that was a bad way to behave. The movie will instruct us that like he behaved badly. No, no. 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 <laughs> she needs to At stop no being point. such a naggy bitch. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like. That is like that. That would be the character description. It would be naggy bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the casting Wife. listing, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what they sent out on Actors Access. <laughs> yeah, and and what's so hard? It's like uh uh I I I'm somebody who considers myself a feminist. So uh when I see women portrayed as just Take, like, she was getting crapped upon and then, like, being punished for, like, saying, please don't. Like, just stop. Yes. If I saw her on the train, I would, I would go, do you need help? There are shelters. <laughs> you come here. I can help you. This isn't about Jesus. This is about your personal safety. You come on. <laughs> and I would, I would liberate her. Well, I got to say, this movie takes Jesus over personal safety quite a few times. Oh, abs- no question. Yes. Jesus <laughs> Jesus would leave her on that train and be like, yeah, go for her jaw. Her jaw looks weak, according to this movie. <laughs> you got to hit her body, man. Cops can see black eyes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and just in case this movie wasn't racist enough quite yet, this is where we get to meet Miss Clara, Whose house, uh, apparently Elizabeth is, is showing. Yes. And the first scene we ever see with Miss Clara, she is making a white teenager uncomfortable with how racist she is. Yes. She's paying him <laughs> for mowing her lawn or something. And, but the way she speaks, you can see the actor or the character or probably both is just like, you don't need to talk that way. I don't know <laughs> anyone who talks that way. That's. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. Am I done in the movie? I can go. Okay. <laughs> now, I do want to point out one feature of the home that I found interesting. Apparently, Miss Clara keeps an answered prayer board. And I was dying for them to walk into another room where she's got 7,000 unanswered prayer boards somewhere else, like all stacked <laughs> up in the basement or something. And no. next, to her, next to her prayer board, she had a picture of Martin Luther King. Yes. Just to further... Because because she was black, Eli, yeah, because black people have pictures of Martin Luther King. Ever, I don't know. Keisha, how many... You're in your home. How many pictures of Martin Luther King can you see at this moment? Well, you have to understand I'm doodling a picture of him right now. <laughs> making, making out with Harriet Tubman. <laughs> well... Malcolm X is uh, punching white police officers in the face, and they're all eating uh, tons of fried chicken saying, hope Obama and change. It's an elaborate doodle. Wow, it's it's an extensive doodle. I'm I'm just impressed. Yeah. I I mean, it's like no big deal, but I just like started it like five minutes ago, but it's like... It's one of the, like, thousand in my bedroom, so, like, no big deal. You have a beautiful mind of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X right. <laughs> menage a well, see, You don't understand how much work you just made for me, because now I'm going to have to draw that doodle as the image for this week's episode. So. <laughs> Should be fun. I hope nobody comes in and sees it. I'll be charged with a hate crime, but uh, this movie... Was a hate crime. I wanted so when she kept saying, "This isn't my favorite room." I wanted so badly for her favorite room to be a dildo dungeon, just <laughs> pendulette sex tub against the wall and fucking a sex swing, and she just walks her in there and she's like, "Have you ever seen someone get fucked by a machine?" Because girl, get ready. <laughs> now this is called a Sibian. God ain't say nothing about machines. <laughs> <laughs> My husband couldn't do this. <laughs> Every war has a strategy. And sometimes <laughs> you need a machine gun. <laughs> 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 See, in my mind right now, it's uh, Terminator 3, but her vagina. <laughs> and they're winning her vagina, and it's a war against humanity or her orgasm. Anyway, I'm writing it right now. Ironically, uh, still called Judgment Day. <laughs> 
And then uh, there, there was this like super quick um, scene that I have to bring up because there was just so much sexism baked into this scene. Oh, and, the uh, um, it, I'm so excited. The Elizabeth at work scene. Yes, yes, that's Correct. the one. So yeah, I just exactly. want to. I want to plant a flag. Her friends look like they rented two wax dummies of attractive women, but left them in a van in a hot van <laughs> for like eight to twelve hours, and then when they pulled them out, they were like, "Oh, oh, well, you know what? It's fine." <laughs> It's fine. We'll just shoot them anyways. They look like these melted half humans. But this is where we get the line, it's hard to submit to a man like that sometime. Yes. And th- yeah. that, that submit word is going to come up again. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that is explained away. That is quote unquote explained away when the woman says, sometimes submitting is like God telling you to duck so he can hit your man. Right. Yes. <laughs> Which, if that was supposed to make me feel better, I mean, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak for it, but Keisha, did that make you feel like it was sort of on even footing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you for deferring to me. A, that goes against the movie. <laughs> B, B, uh, it, like, there was just something where I think I audibly said, oh no. Yes. And. <laughs> oh god. I, like a horror yeah. movie. <laughs> Because yeah. in my mind, I was like, submitting like light BDSM or like, oh, no, you mean God. Okay. And, and no, for the, not okay. And for the first time, I would be, would have been okay if she had been like, I don't know, we've been playing with some pegging stuff. I would have been like, oh, thank God. She was just talking about sex. <laughs> she was just talking about sex, guys. It's all right. She wasn't talking about like her in, in disproportionate relationship between men and women. She was just talking about him tying her up and fucking her. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Weirdest, Ooh. weirdest girl talk moment I've ever seen. It's like, you know what I like to do when I submit to rape? I pretend I won't submit for a few minutes. <laughs> and the girl goes, you, you mean you, you get raped? Well, no, 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 no. I know I'm going to submit eventually. I, I read it in Cosmo. It's exciting for them. <laughs> Sex tip I, number four. Terrifying. I feel like, <laughs> terrifying. I feel scene. like the deleted scene was, no, I'm worth less. No, I'm worth less. No, I'm worth less. No, stop. No, you stop. Someone should hit us. Oh, boy. You're women. Shit. (laughs) Then someone comes in and they're like, hey, Trisha, are you on your period? Oh, yeah, I am. Get out of the village. You get out of the village for a week and a half. Sorry. sorry. No one touch her on her way out there. Just wanders off into the desert. We never see Trisha again. (laughs) Now we need a red heifer. God damn it. And they burn the office. Burn her. It's unclean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And then we get, uh, uh, we go back to Tony, who is, oh, we, we, we missed Veronica earlier. This, he, he, when we first meet Tony, he's closing the big deal. And there's this, um, this, uh, vixen that comes up to him and tries to peddle her wares. Oh, you closed the big deal. Well, uh, I'd like to close it now. And I, I would like to point out that the vixen temptress character in this movie, Looks exactly like a shark. She looks precisely like a shark in a wig. If, if I scanned the credits, cause I expected next to her character's name to just see shark in a wig. Cause that's what she looks like. A shark in a wig. She wasn't as hot as Elizabeth. I don't know if I'd go as far as shark in a wig. She looks like a shark in a wig. You Google image her right now, and you're going to be like, oh, that's a shark in a wig. And then you tweet. You tweet at Noah, and I don't care what you tweet at Noah. You tweet at whatever you want. I mean, they definitely – see, for me, though, I thought she had intensely curved eyebrows, and all I could think was, oh – because curved eyebrows like that mean you're a demon, like you are a demon from hell. Curved eyebrows. With a vagina. Otherwise known as horns. <laughs> yes. Uh, demon from hell with a vagina. Uh, succubus, but like suck that bus. And by bus, I mean bang bus. Bang my dick. <laughs> anyway, see, I brought it back. I brought it back. Brought it back. Full circle. Full circle. Holy shit, Tanae Downing, she does... I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I doubted you. Shark in a wig, sir. She does look like a shark in a wig. Thank you. You nailed it. Shark in a wig. I want to see her movie. (laughs) Uh, So then... Finding Nemo (laughs) 3. There's only one way for us to find you, and that's for me to seduce this pharmaceutical rep. (laughs) All right. So then we go... So, yeah, 
Now we're back at Miss Clara's. Yes. Uh, -huh. uh, where she is desperately trying to get this woman to talk about selling her house, but she is conducting a mild version of the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no one ever expects that, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, this has got to be like the realtor's nightmare. You go in, you just want to get the fucking, how much do you want for the house and shit? And she's like, how about some Jesus? Right, exactly. How's your Jesus? Is your Jesus Jesus enough? And then she plays the little coffee prank on her. <laughs> the analogy that she's trying to make here, she asks, how's your prayer life? And she says, uh, is it hot or cold? And she says, yeah, in between. So she gives her coffee that's in between hot and cold. And so what I, what I, what this left me wondering is does that make atheism the iced coffee of theism? Because I'm okay with yeah, that. It's, it's a delicious. frappuccino. Who doesn't like iced coffee. That's awesome. crazy. Or or coffee ice cream. Let's go further. Yeah, oh right. hell's oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. maybe right. agnostics are like iced coffee, <laughs> and like if you're spiritual, it's kind of lukewarm. And uh, I mean, I don't have my thermometer, but uh, I can take a temperature of the milk later. Yeah. Also. <laughs> Why did – so in the movie, they all drank their coffee black. And all I could think is, so what is cream in this metaphor? <laughs> why Why is there no cream or sugar? Please indulge <laughs> oh, <shit>. me. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, rationality, reason, perhaps. Right, exactly. And uh, – Sugar is joy, obviously. Another reason why uh, – because it's fun. It's exp atheism. <laughs> it's fun. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. And it makes you fat. <laughs> Things that we all know are true of atheism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've been reading Conservapedia again. That's right. <laughs> she asks at one point, the, the, the actual question Miss Clara asks is, how is your prayer life? Now, keep in mind that, that this Elizabeth character has not said that she's Christian up to this point. Right. Well, uh, first off, it's the odd thing. When you were black, that is an assumption that still is jarring to me. <laughs> That's the thing of, like, black, Christian, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> Unless you're in jail, in which case you're a Muslim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, to, welcome to being my nose and face structure. People are just like, so you're Jewish. You know a good lawyer. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's, it's the equivalent. So it's just like that, it's right? It's just like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. equally hard to be a white Jew. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, hear me yeah. out. What I'm a saying is that it's Jew. just yeah, like exactly. being a white Jew. Yeah. Uh, well, let's equivocate like Thunderfoot further. every time I hear from you, sir. <laughs> and of course, this is also the scene where we find out how the movie gets its name. Because we've already teased the, this is my third favorite room. This is my fifth favorite room. Now she's going to show her her favorite room, which is a closet. With prayers in it. And she says, Th I call this my war room. She says, why? She says, because Schizophrenia Closet didn't do well with the test audiences. We had to go with something exciting sounding. Delusion. So, Delusion cupboard didn't play well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we went with war room. I mean, I would call it my magical thinking closet. <laughs> sure. My magical thinking land. My pretending box. My pretending <laughs> box. Yeah, that... I mean, that would sell a lot more. I also, uh, yeah, yeah. I also want to point out, this is the first, like, relationship talk she has with Myth Clara, where she gets the two worst pieces of advice I could possibly imagine. The first is she says, my husband is emotionally abusive, to which she responds, how often do you pray for your husband? Right. Which is basically like being like, someone's really cruel to me. Yeah, have you ever tried casting a magic spell on him? <laughs> <laughs> And then How later, do you do that? she's like, she's sitting there, we cut to them sitting there and talking, and she's venting. She's venting to someone who she has taken as a friend. She's like, I don't know how to feel, and sometimes he's really cruel to me. To which Miss Clara responds, shut up and talk about my invisible friend some more. <laughs> right. All you've done, she's like, all you've done is sit there and complain. But how much magic spell have you tried to do? Have you even tried in Guardian <laughs> Leviosa? <laughs> I don't see no golden snitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and she also tells her that she needs a <laughs> a prayer strategy at this point. And that, I, I, my brain really went with that one. I'm thinking like, all right, we're going to send 50% of the prayers against the main front and uh, an auxiliary force of our fathers bolstering the eastern flank. We'll send the, uh, a force of elite birthday wishes in the night before to wreak havoc with their supply lines. <laughs> we'll, we'll support it with air invocations. But the problem is there's no exit strategy in your idea, Noah. Like, <laughs> right. How are we going to get out? 
Like, oh, just when, be... it, when all the prayers don't work, at the end, we'll say that it's because <laughs> China secretly fed soldiers into whatever we were praying about, and then we just slowly back away and leave the country in ruins. And just leave I, it yeah. in. Jesus is coming back any second. He's going to take care of the exit strategy. That's an exit part. strategy right there that you just described. The second yeah, well, if we have enough of a prayer strategy, we could get a whole hardcore history episode about it. Now, I like to imagine, I like to imagine Britney <laughs> oh, Spears God. praying. Britney Spears, and then, then nothing happens. <laughs> Again. Again. <laughs> and so, now, here's kind of, I guess, where the plot of the movie kicks in, because Miss Clara tells Elizabeth that she needs one hour a day to teach her to pray, because Jesus magic is seven and a half times harder than great abs, I guess. Right. Uh, her advice is exactly, and I'm I'm going to say this quote without accent because because I should not say it with the accent. Men <laughs> no don't likes it when these women trying to fix them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that was more racist was without the accent. That is the Holy words shit. that white men wrote down yes. for an African American <laughs> woman to say. Well. It, it's because the word uppity doesn't test well with audiences. I mean, I mean, you could trim that down, but like, you know, it, it just doesn't test well. I would uh, love to, to be able to do just a quick control F for uppity on the original script for this movie. Right. 763 yeah, things right, found. Right. But mostly in the descriptions of the characters. Yeah. <laughs> So mildly inaccurate is what you're saying. Yeah. These, okay. these black accents, mildly inaccurate. Uh, and she sends her home with the advice: love him, respect him, and pray for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wish away your that. That is the first and foremost moral of this story. Do not solve your problems. Wish to Jesus that they're already solved. That's the key piece of advice this movie is giving. Right. And then it's time for her battle plan montage. Where she reads the Bible and it's like they've got some hardcore rock and roll in the background where it's like, good turn it turn the Bible. She's reading the Bible. She clears out her closet. It's time for her to pray. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. That was the moment in the movie that took me out because I was like, that's not what she would listen to. Drop a beat on it. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, rap about Jesus. Don't rock out to Jesus. Have you ever seen white people try to rap about Jesus? It is the second most offensive thing I've ever seen. The first <laughs> being this movie. This yeah, movie most. right here. <laughs> well, and I love it because at first, you know, we have to, you know, no montage is complete if she gets it too quickly. So we have to show that she's not very good at praying now. So her daughter comes in and she's like sitting in the closet eating chips and drinking a Sprite. Right. But what I love about this, okay, so the daughter shows up, uh, and, and, while well, she's in the closet and acts like she just caught her masturbating with a butternut squash while choking herself with a fucking necktie. I, I, like, it was just this, like, oh my God, you're in a closet thing moment where I guess we were supposed to feel like this is a, a horribly embarrassing thing to have happen. Yeah. It wasn't the fucking dildo dungeon. I mean, it was embarrassing. She's a woman and she was eating for pleasure. Get out of here. Get out of here. You pig. She should have just opened the closet door and been like, you're a pig and then closed the door. <laughs> Let's not forget that during the can't get it right montage, what she can't get right is sitting in a chair. Right. She tries a variety of chairs. Which she sits in like she just grew legs out of a otherwise entirely torso body. And she's like, wait, do legs, do I, do they fold into themselves? Do I just, if I hold my nose and my mouth at the same time and I blow, will they fly off my body? I have no idea how to sit in a chair. <laughs> so she ends up just eating chips and terrifying the w little white friend, by the way. We have a little yes, white girl yes. friend in this movie. Uh, who will come in to judge the African American woman throughout. That is this care. That little girl, her entire character journey and her only direction was, you're upset and surprised by everything that that character does. Because whatever she does, it scares you. It scares you. Yeah. She shouldn't be doing it. So then they close the closet door and she screams, I can have all the chips I want at the children as they run away like a monster. Well and one of the things that like helps to button the scene is they insult her foot odor as a problem. Oh yes, uh-huh. Uh, uh cuz uh 
What is a woman if not stinky and eating alone? <laughs> having no value. Stinking and eating so, alone, the Eli Bosnick story. <laughs> Listen, you're not a black woman. You can't take that story. Oh, no, it's totally fine for me to be those things. It's still my story, but it's fine. I get to fuck whoever I want and take a cab whenever I want. It's amazing. <laughs> I could fight a cop right now. I could run at a cop with three lives. <laughs> Nothing would happen to me. They'd ask me quietly to put them down. It's amazing. <laughs> Oh, oh, boy. Shit, I oh, I was so afraid there was a there. pause. Holy I was afraid shit. Keisha got murdered. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's happening. <laughs> oh, shit. They heard cop over she, Skype. Yeah, she laughed a little too loud at one of the jokes. Yeah. And now they're in there. <laughs> so then we move on to uh, to another gym scene with, um, with the EMT buddy. Because every time they have a fight, we then have to see him working out his, his black man rage on uh, Which, physical Let implements. me say, I will say... If we're going to talk about something good that happens in this movie, he is a very attractive man, and his body is very well maintained. A, he's a sexy bastard. I'm just, I'm just, that. Yeah, I'm just saying. That, that was a moment. I was just because I remember sitting there. I was just like, I wonder what workout they're doing. Like he looks great. <laughs> he looks really? really good. Oh, I, you don't? Are you not into the? I I thought he looked really good. His, his arms were too big, but the abs. I was all about the abs. Literally, I thought about anything else. I I made myself gay so I didn't have to think about the plot of this movie. I changed my sexuality. Don't believe anything anyone's told you. You can do it. You just got to try hard enough. I was gay for this movie so I didn't have to think about this woman of exposing herself to emotional abuse while she wished super hard in her closet. <laughs> That's a great uh, synopsis of the film. Okay, we're done. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, no, I I, I looked at uh, the actor who played Tony's body, and I went, "That's like, like, what are you hiding? Why? <laughs> like, why are you doing that? That tiny like tiny little penis." That's a cut scene from the movie. And then we get to <laughs> my favorite scene in the whole fucking movie. This would be the um, the mugger scene. <laughs> yeah, the mugger. <laughs> Where who again in the tradition of of the of this movie they made white racist. <laughs> they were just like, listen, racist. we're not racist. Look, we made the mugger white, and he has a baseball cap yeah, on. So. See, see, I guarantee you, if you called the Kendrick brothers today and were like, hey, you guys made a viciously racist movie, they'd be like, mm -hmm. did you see the mugger? <laughs> 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 Slam dunk, click. <laughs> Yeah, so this mugger, he sees um, a, an older black woman, and he's like, oh, there's some money right there. So he runs up and tries to mug her while she's with Elizabeth, and Miss Clara defeats him with pure Jesus sass. Good rebuking. Yes, a good rebuking. Yes, as if this movie didn't have enough bad lessons in it <laughs> for the people who watched yes. it. They needed to throw in the fact that old women should refuse to give up the whatever money they have in their purses and get stabbed to death by money. Yes, because Jesus <laughs> will protect you. Wasn't enough bad information in this movie that they just... I, if, they, if the next scene they had just shown Miss Clara sticking a fork into a socket and being like, this is totally fine. What a great way to get things out when they're stuck in here. Uh, I mean, uh, she, I mean, there must have been part of her that was like... That's only a knife. Uh, white people <laughs> usually carry guns. We cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and also, it was a stabbing. My first thought is, that's a knife. I can run. You can't do much. <laughs> like, yeah. like, just like, like, move. Like, get out of the way. Like, <laughs> go faster. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. Miss Clara could juke him out and just break his ankles. <laughs> just like, <laughs> oh! That would have been more interesting. That fight scene. Oh, uh, my with God. Miss Clara <laughs> and the mugger. Oh, I wish Miss Clara had used black kung fu. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and then we go right back to Clara's house after, or Miss Clara's house after the uh, mugging, and we get bet more terrible, shitty marital advice about how you right. should ignore everything and count on Jesus. 
Right. What? Write down everything your husband's ever done wrong. No, no, no. I'm not going to look at that list, even though it might have incredibly valid complaints. I'm going to ignore you and tell you to do more magic thinking. Yes, exactly. And this is where we get the uh, Grace talk, where she tells if she, where she explains what an irredeemable piece of dog shit we all are, and how we deserve to choke to death on God's dingleberries for eternity, but He doesn't make us. So hallelujah. That's Christianity in a nutshell, isn't it? Well, I mean, uh, according to Miss Clara, it is. I mean, it, it's different um, for women of her age and stature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they get a different Bible, a sassy <laughs> black woman's Bible. <laughs> I mean, the, that's the one that has rooms in it that are for secret praying. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> it's got um, a whole strategy. It's got a whole section on how to take a punch. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is basically a a conspiracy movie that really removes the veil of how black people pray and it works, and white people pray and it doesn't. That's why black people are so much better off than white people! (laughs) Explains so much! I knew there was a reason you guys had it so good. (laughs) They made it seem like plagiarizing Bible verses onto loose leaf paper is somehow both physically and intellectually rigorous. So yes. Like, she's drinking raw eggs. She's sweating profusely. <laughs> she's sweatpants right. on. It's ridiculous. Exactly. There's a Bible verse with a chicken, or a chicken with a Bible verse written on it running around her backyard. She grabs it, <laughs> fucking nails it head first into her wall. <laughs> Doesn't she go into shake at some point? Like she just starts like shaking yes, or rocking uh-huh. herself? Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. just. Just making sure that that was the right time she was That wasn't shaking. a nightmare you had? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I would shake when my husband made me feel emotionally unsafe. But uh, no, this is reasonable. So <laughs> You should write down everything your husband's done to make you feel unsafe so I can ignore it and tell you to <laughs> pray and close your eyes and wish it better. Yeah. Ignore it. Go in your closet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and speaking of... Emotional abuse. This is also where we cut to uh, Tony having his date with Aqua Woman. And, okay, what are the odds of this? They're supposed to be, he's supposed to be out of town in a different fucking city. And apparently one of Elizabeth's friends sees Tony at the restaurant is like, hey, I think your man's fucking this, uh, this shark lady. What do you think? Right. And this, this is where she has her breakdown slash conversation with the devil. (laughs) Which is my favorite scene in the movie. So, if you've ever been to a party with a couple that needs to break up, and so they have a screaming fight in front of everyone at that party, and you're, everyone just holds perfectly still, like, like it's fucking Jurassic Park and their vision is based on movement, and you just watch these people have a screaming fight, that's what happens with this scene, except it's her and absolutely fucking nobody. No. She just, wanders around her house being like, and you know what? I haven't had an orgasm from you in two years. Oh, no. Don't you talk to me that way. Don't. I don't even want to hear it. I don't want to. Oh, it's always about my mother. It's always about my mother. And I just, I wanted so badly for the camera to pan over to a fat white guy in a devil suit just like eating a bowl of mashed potatoes just like, whoa. <laughs> what the fuck did I do, man? <laughs> Come on. I wanted them to pan over because I hope they had a pool in that house. Like, like, and the devil would be a, like on a floaty being right. like, hey, girl, I'm just going to stay in this pool for a little bit. But, like, I can't talk to you when you're like this. I'm just going to hang out in the pool. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> but like God. the first mention of the devil... In this film, I was like, huh, devil seems relatable. But by the time I see you were like yelling at him, I'm like, poor devil. What right. has he done to you? I haven't seen anything. Stop picking on this devil. You know who you should yell at? Tony. Right. <laughs> by the way, if you think that Tony's ever going to get the yelling at that the devil does, you are wrong. Nope. She gets it out of her system there. And it's not enough. That she wanders around her house screaming at an imaginary invisible monster while her daughter is upstairs. She knows her daughter's upstairs. She then goes outside and starts yelling, just in case all of the neighbors didn't know about the schizophrenia yet. 
Oh, and again, I can't stress enough how much I want to watch a second movie about the neighbors of the main characters of this film. <laughs> Hopefully, the same, if they could live in between the couple from Fireproof <laughs> and the couple, just that same couple that hates each other. It's just like, oh, the black girl's, the black girl's yelling. Is she yelling at us? Again. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's the devil. It's fine. Yeah. It's but fine. I, I was worried about a mental health crisis for a second. Uh, yes. but it's just the devil. It's right. That's okay. <laughs> Let it go. I mean, mental health, whatever, but, uh, devil, we can relate to. That's understandable. Yeah, totally fine. And by the way, speaking of the daughter, the daughter comes down at some point and is rightly terrified that her mother is screaming into space and then just goes back upstairs to bed. Yeah. Just like, if I came downstairs at the ripe old age of eight or however old this girl is, <laughs> and my dad was just on the front porch being like, you listen to me, Methuselah. I'm gonna get, you don't fucking talk to me that way. I'll fuck you up, alright? Mano a mano. Ain't nothing between you and me but fear and atmosphere, motherfucker. I'd be like, oh, okay, time to call the doctor. But because it's this movie, they're just like, yeah, whatever. I guess mommy's going through a thing. Her feet smell bad. <laughs> It's like the caveman's Valentine. It was like schizophrenia as told from the inside. Well, and there's a point where, like, if you were her daughter, wouldn't you come downstairs and be like, hey, mom, here's a journal. You can get your thoughts out on this. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to sleep. I have things to do. I'm eight. I'm eight. I've got double Dutch practice in the morning, so, so if you could get on some kind of anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> that would be so nice. And then we learn that uh, Elizabeth's prayers have been answered because Jesus has smited her adulterous husband with the squirts. Right, but because she scared away the devil, it makes me think that the devil was preventing the squirts. <laughs> so that the devil, once she scares the devil out of her house, the devil, she also scares the devil out of her husband? And the devil, is the devil what prevents diarrhea? Is the thesis of this movie? Well, of course, once you get the devil out of your house, what do devils like? Buttholes. Uh, do you, do you miss <laughs> that go part? Somewhere. It's... God loves Uganda. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, everything in time has shown us that uh, God is in Uganda and Zimbabwe <laughs> and South Africa. I could just Where go Where he's on. just crushing it. <laughs> so now the daughter, again, the the comparisons of this movie to a to a horror movie especially the shining the scene mm-hmm. cuz the daughter wanders in the next scene is the daughter wanders into the prayer closet and it is it is shot for shot finding all work and no yes. play makes jack a dull boy <laughs> no, 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 same shit <laughs> except instead of them going Oh, you're crazy. Let me go hide in the freezer with this knife. They're just like, can I do this too? It's like if The Shining had just, instead of that, the kid had just been like, oh, fuck this tricycle. All work and no play makes Danny a dull boy. I love it. Let's get her. Listen, however you have to get your children to buy in, you do. Now, if they had more axes in The Shining, it would have been a different movie. It's true, and if they had had a second mini axe for Danny. Right. Yeah. Here's Johnny and Danny and also Danny. Yeah, and also Danny. It's bring my kid to go crazy day. Sorry. Danny, He's really enthusiastic. Danny pops through the dog door at the bottom or something. I love it. Oh, that would be a, like a really cute The Shining. <laughs> That'd be cute. Like, you mean cuter. Yeah, right, I mean, right, exactly. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Come you're right. surfing out on the elevator blood, that would be pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, He's wearing we have Ra- a- Ray-Bans. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, we have to learn that we get a- another Being Jesus-y montage where we learn that um, that Elizabeth is now so prayerful that she's falling asleep in her prayer room which gives us yet another opportunity to laugh at her body odor when the UPS guy shows up. And physical appearance and hair. Again, yes, all uh-huh. the things that you could possibly be racist about on an African-American and, woman. Well, and sexist about. Oh, and sexist about. We take a moment to have a white character be like, oh, you look like garbage. You look like hot, wet garbage. You're the worst. You're the worst. I may vomit. I may vomit at the sight of your natural hair. Yeah. 
<laughs> I may vomit and shit. I mean, I'm just showing up here unannounced. How right. dare you do not look fuckable at all right. times? <laughs> like, all Brown's I know is Beyonce and Rihanna. <laughs> That's all I know. Beyonce and Rihanna is all I know. So if I can't, don't want to put my dick in you, you are not acceptable. You get <laughs> fucked out. You're gross. You're gross. <laughs> You're gross. I, the UPS guy, condemn you. <laughs> and then, of course, Tony comes home. Uh, from his business trip where he finds Elizabeth's phone and sees that her friend has busted him and texted him about the chick he was, he was, uh, flirting with. Right, exactly. Which, and to her knowledge, he has cheated on her. Right. She has not, she did not get feedback from Satan didn't come back and be like, there, you happy? You happy? You made a big scene and I gave him diarrhea, alright? Alright, this is what we were talking about with Dr. Glauber. You scream at me, I do what you say, and we get into a negative communication loop. You didn't even read Who Moved My Cheese Relationship Edition, did you? I made it all the way through Men of the Mars and Women of the Venus, and I feel like I'm the only one who's working on this, Elizabeth! <laughs> So then we get, um, and this was another one that really killed in the theater we're in. So he finds out, he knows, she knows, and they go to eat dinner, and when she she puts food on the on the table, and then when she turns her back, he switches his food for her food, and everyone in the audience goes, ha, she's going to murder him with poison, I get it. Well, when you have all of those feelings inside because you've been emotionally abused, uh, I think that's a fair... Th- conclusion if I she can't... murdered him with poison i would have been okay yes exactly Yeah, if she had poisoned him i would have been like okay movie i'm on i'm with <laughs> it Andrea, if the if all of a sudden she had turned around something in the prayer closet and it had just been like how to make us and just a page cut out of the anarchist cookbook <laughs> and she was just she'd just been making prussic acid in there i'd be like that's why she needs a closet i'm in it movie she goes on a murder spree Spree. No, no, no. Uh, and instead, he finds out that she's been zombi- zombified with Jesus, to which he says, Hooray, my wife no longer exhibits signs of free will. Lucky well, me. Well, he's suspicious. He's yeah. suspicious of the fact that she's now going to let him walk. He's like, now, when you say you're going to let me treat you like shit, I get to treat you like shit? And she's like, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, 100% all the time. And he's like, huh. I don't know if I'm okay with you. I might still be mad at you for this. He's a little mad. A little bit, Just yes. a little. He's just like a little like, uh, you say you're going to be my slave, but I don't know. It doesn't count if you want it. Uh. <laughs> uh, but you can't like it. Otherwise, it's not domestic abuse. Uh. <laughs> Never let me have this. <laughs> She's so damn greedy. <laughs> and now we, because, like, again, the movie could just end here, but it doesn't. Instead, we add a little little bit of conflict when we meet Tom. Now, Tom is the mean boss and also the Ill- illegitimate love child of William H. Macy and Pee Wee Herman. And he's <laughs> noticed right. that there were some problems with Tony's inventory. This is Rob Reiner if he went on, like, a juice fast. <laughs> 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 That's what this character looks like. Yeah. Meathead. Oh, see, that, yeah, that you're talking about um, uh, poor man's Billy Bob Thornton? Yeah. Yeah, I was talking about the other guy in the bow tie. So, yeah, that's basically... Oh, you're talking got, about... T- yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically you've got Rob Reiner on a juice fest on one side, and you've got Bill Nye's unfuckable cousin on the other. Yeah, he looks like the bad guy from every Nickelodeon TV Yes, movie. yes, exactly. Right? He's you the stole principal. the formula for the bubble McGubble gum. <laughs> yeah, what am I going to do? What's some kid going to tell me? Oh, no, they filled my shower with blue ink. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll have to be blue for the entire third act. <laughs> Again, that would have made for a better movie. Okay. Uh, Anything but... <laughs> Like all other things, all other changes. So now we, we now Tony pulls up in the it pulls up in the garage here after after learning that maybe there were some problems with his inventory, and we can tell that it's going to be bad news because it's raining. Right. Yeah. Well, and clearly she's not praying enough or like <laughs> washing her feet enough. Right. I mean, <laughs> basically, she's a rancid, impure, not holy enough woman. So I'm going to go stick my dick in stuff. Uh, <laughs> and even the UPS guy won't fuck her. Yeah. 
She's in a big old house and UPS is like, no, thank you. I can do (laughs) better. You're garbage. (laughs) You're garbage. Well, as much as I'd love to say that the movie ended here, it didn't. So we've got more review yet to come. But before we dive into the finale, we're going to take a well-earned break. So let me very quickly give Act 3 the hard sell. Will Tony find Jesus? Yes. Will Elizabeth start taking antipsychotics? No. Will any movie-level thing ever happen at any point in this motherfucker? Fuck no. (laughs) Find out the answer to these questions and more when we return for the tedious conclusion of War Room. Oh, no, the ball went out into the street. I'll get it. Hold on, little buddy. G.I. Jesus. Jesus. Were you about to run into the street to grab the ball, Tommy? Uh Uh-huh. Hmm. Well, let me give you both an important piece of advice before you do. Okay. Okay. Remember, and this is very important, before you go out into the street to get something, you should always shun black people. Sorry, what? Say again? Hanging out with black people is called race mixing, and it's specifically forbidden in Genesis 28 and Deuteronomy 7 and 32. But my dad says they're all pink on the inside, so it doesn't matter. And also, don't forget to revile the Jews like it says in John 8 and Matthew 27. And my mommy says I can play with whoever I want. Yes, but your mother is a woman, so what the hell does she know? Excuse me? Hold on a second. Are, are you sure you're not a, a Nazi? Now, come on, kids. If you're disobedient, I might just have to murder you with rocks, as prescribed in Deuteronomy 21 and Proverbs 13. You can't do that. According to the Bible, I can. It also says I can hit you with a stick whenever I want. I didn't know it said that in the Bible, G.I. Jesus. Well, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. What? What's the other half? Uh, talking to yourself in a closet. Hmm. Have you ever wished that you could unlock your magic old black lady Jesus powers? Do you yearn to stop muggers, fix marriages, and give people vengeance diarrhea using only the powers of your gumption? Well, now you can, because for the first time ever, the never-before-released sassy black woman Bible could be yours for the low, low price of forty nine ninety nine. You'll learn passages they don't have in the regular white people Bible. Passages like... And yea, verily, he said unto her, Let not your hat be normal-sized, but instead let it be a giant and very expensive one. He who walks without the hat the size of a sailboat fucking a manatee covered in birds walks not in the light of the Lord. And lo, they agreed with what was being said, spoken or viewed, and so pressed their tongues to the back of their throats and spake the mm-hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was good. For even though Miss Sherry's Jam won the prize at church competition every year, she only attended church on Easter and Christmas, so she was cast out. And because it was heard that her husband had something on the side, and she knew about it because verily some women just don't know how to keep their men. So don't hesitate. Act now and unlock your magical sassy black woman powers today. And we're back for yet more self-inflicted punishment. Last we heard, Tony had lost his job. But just in case getting fired isn't one of those universally recognized bad things, the director chooses to reinforce that message with a quick nightmare sequence. Yeah, where Tony has a kung fu fight with Tony. (laughs) Which was cliche when they did it in Empire Strikes Back, by the way. Right, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm I'm sure you were sad that Tony was wearing a shirt in the fight scene. I was. I was, in fact. If they had taken he off their shirts up. and maybe Tony and Tony started to kiss a little bit. Like, at first, Tony doesn't want to kiss, but then big, strong Tony grabs Tony in his arms and he just presses his lips to his mouth and you just you just watch Tony's knees go weak. Yeah. And what? And um, you need to edit all of that out. I'm getting married in less than a year. All right, cut, cut. No, that's, that's going to be the would, teaser that starts the show can. right there. <laughs> all I can think is like, and, and then all of a sudden, like evil Tony goes, no, let it happen. And Tony's <laughs> like, all right. He's like, you got a good body. I know I do. You got a good body too. And then, <laughs> and then the rest of this movie, and then there's 90 minutes of just condomless <laughs> bareback fucking. <laughs> And you know what I would think to myself? I would think, wow, the second half of that movie was better than the first half of that movie. (laughs) At least we now know it's going somewhere. All right. Right. I get this. 
So, but instead, no, we go nowhere. Instead, Tony wakes up and he wanders around his house like a roaming spirit clinging to the mortal realm. And then he he finds the, the prayer room as well. And I, I want to say, I think... I haven't done the math here, but I believe about 18% of this movie's runtime is people finding other people's prayer closets. Yeah. Everybody has a walk-in closet. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't have... I couldn't walk into my closet and pray. I could walk into my closet and hang myself, but I certainly (laughs) couldn't pray in there. Mine's not that big. the hell out of watching this movie. (laughs) Well, and, and earlier in the film, he... Tony insults her for, like, not making enough money, but, like... The moral of the story is she, like, if she's really submitting to her husband, her husband should at least, like, do his damn job and work all the jobs. Like, right. she's <laughs> the breadwinner who has to submit and get yelled at. Where is any woman in this writer's room? I mean, they... Make- oh, I, I'm sure, like, doling out the sandwiches and pouring the coffee. <laughs> what do you think? They fed themselves yeah. during their writing? <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> no, they were just busy deleting their Ashley Madison accounts. Um, <laughs> right. Just, they just, just carefully going through. Those were the two women on Ashley Madison, the wives of the authors of this movie. <laughs> we found them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, what is, what is it like to be married to a person who has made at least two movies that we know of about how marriage is terrible and it's miserable, but you have to stick with it anyway, otherwise the devil will eat your balls or whatever. I mean, what does that say to these guys' wives? Well, uh, it says exactly what you just said, but they can't answer back because they're stupid, dumb oh, women. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so powdering does, it, shoes. does it matter it's not a conversation it's a monologue so <laughs> they can shut their whore faces and stop being complaining that's true if they only had one side of the intelligence squared debate we'd have a pretty conclusive debate <laughs> all right here's william lane craig for three hours <laughs> God. And then, then he's gonna look at a chair and act like Sam Harris didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Sam's got nothing to say about this. This is a drag out knockdown punch. <laughs> And then we get another friend, uh, scene with him hanging out with his buddy. And I only bring it up because, uh, we have to have the obligatory women be loving day closets scene. Oh, of course. The women day be loving their closets. And of course, there's the weird, I'm so envious of how much your wife prays scene. They talk about what? praying like it's anal. They're like, <laughs> oh, she like, she just prays all the time? Yeah, man. <laughs> She just constantly prays, bro. Constantly prayer on tap. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you ever, like, watch her when she prays and then you Dude, start sometimes. praying? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes she'll be praying and I'll just start praying. I'll just start <laughs> praying, bro. She doesn't even know. But then our kid comes in and prays with us. It gets weird. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> it's a little weird. The other night I woke up in the middle of the night, she was just praying over me. Just praying over me in the middle of the night, man. So I prayed <laughs> myself to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, we, we hadn't really mentioned the, the double Dutch undercurrent to this movie yet. And I, I honestly thought that this was going to be kind of a cool twist to it because at first, when we first learned out that the girls on a double Dutch team, dad's like, that isn't a sport. That's bullshit. And I thought at the very least that maybe, you know, like dad would learn that that really is a good sport. And he kind of does, but they don't even really fuck with it. I just bring that up now because eventually that becomes the only part of this movie that matters. So. Right. Yeah. No, we're going to, we're going to close out on some serious double Dutch. And if you're thinking that we're going to see some like really high end double Dutching, like some really no. impressive aerobic double Dutching, no, we are not, because no. double dutch is a limited and boring sport. I, I, I just want to point out, by the way, that double dutch is fucking awesome, but what you see in this movie is absolute shit. Okay, I apparently missed out on the great, the greater sides. Maybe it's the Christian stuff, the pros, the, they're amazing. Yeah, like the, the like the really top quality double, double dutch teams are unfucking believable, and it's really impressive shit. And I thought when this movie decided to end at a fucking double dutch competition, I thought, oh, at least we'll get something good here. But no, nope. we didn't. It was is really fucking lame. They got the kids at that particular Christian camp that were best at double dutch, but we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Oh, absolutely, because I have so many thoughts on the sweet double dutch, but my screenwriter (laughs) brain had a realization that you'll understand. So the father ends up in the movie, as you were saying, 
becoming a part of like the daughter's double Dutch desire. And the thing I just realized, that's why they had to show him doing a backflip. Yeah. To show that he can jump and dance and it's It's because it's a tight script that's why yeah everything that's introduced is all comes together that racist thing out of nowhere was foreshadowing yeah Yeah, i call it negro shadowing but it's fine (laughs) shadow shadowing if you will turn off the lights let me see your eyes anyway So then this is where they have, after they come get the car, this is where she should rightly say, hey, what the fuck did you do? But uh-huh. instead, she delivers a monologue about how because she loves Jesus so much, she <laughs> loves him. Yes. And th- something happened during this scene. Did anyone else notice sh- a tear falls out of her eye and <laughs> rolls down her face directly into her open mouth? <laughs> Ew! It's the most, no, I missed most, that. Thank goodness. It's the most terrifying thing in the world. <laughs> it's just because her mouth is wide open from like crying, and the tear rolls directly down her cheek into her mouth, and she swallows it. And I will never think about anything else ever again. <laughs> I mean, this- as God says, "Waste not, want not." That's right. <laughs> yeah, if it's salty, swallow it. And That's the other thing. Swallow. If you yeah, watch exactly. this movie. Watch for the forgiveness scene. She cries directly into her own mouth. It's like a fucking <laughs> Kafka-esque H.P. Lovecraft nightmare. Like, she's just a creature that comes out of the body that cr- constantly cries into its own mouth. Just drowns in its own tears. <laughs> so it, so then, you know, Tony, like, breaks down and says he wants to be more Jesus-y. And so Elizabeth calls Miss Clara. So we get to, we get to watch Miss Clara celebrate. And this is... She goes, buck wild. Oh, my God. Like, this is the moment, I think, where the whole Miss Clara, Aunt Jemima thing absolutely froths over. Oh, this is where it peaked. I stared at Keisha. I stared Keisha in the eye the entire time she danced, which I don't don't know if I'm wrong about this. Keisha, correct me if I'm wrong. Lasted for 487 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) This woman celebrated just like... She did everything except spike the fucking Bible. It was <laughs> horrifying. And me and Keisha had the deepest eye contact we've ever had, that I ever will have or ever have had in this moment as we watched with one eye this woman do 95 hours of racist dancing. And then- the thing that it we're missing, though, is what did it say in the screenplay? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> how, how did you write it? Okay, she dances. Nah, not specific enough. She dances enthusiastically. All right, let's get more specific. <laughs> she does that jazz dancing that makes people want to <laughs> celebrate. Oh, Negro Yeah, that's a good sequence. Pass. <laughs> I was so terrified in this moment. Just in asterisk, this movie. shuck and jive, asterisk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got so terrified at this moment in the movie because, like, she starts as she's dancing, she's going, "My God is good, my God is powerful," and everyone in the audience with us is going, "Mm-hmm, yes, he is." And I was terrified <laughs> that they were going to all break out into song. I'm thinking, "Fuck, I only know." The first twelve words of Amazing Salt and Grace. Salt They're gonna Salt sniff and me shaker. out. <laughs> yeah, the entire audience like turned into Laverne from Scrubs. Right, right. It's like <laughs> three little white girls. Swear to God, right in front of us, three little white girls talking back at the screen, going, "Mm-hmm, testify, Miss Clara." It was really awkward. <laughs> oh, horrifying! I would have just been like, "Hey, Macarena, 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 <laughs> crawl up into the projection booth. They'll think we work here." Dear God, <laughs> Keisha, save yourself. <laughs> no, I can blend. I'm fine. You don't belong here. You're like covered in zombie guts. Yeah. Like walking in. <laughs> covered in the blood of Christ. I right. love it. I just put on an old lady wig and they buy it. It's fine. <laughs> I'm not the appropriate age, but who cares? Who okay, cares? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter to the people who watched or made this movie. So now we go to the the drug confession scene where cause yes. this movie didn't I guarantee you they finished this movie it was supposed to just be credits after he apologizes to his daughter maybe they had planned on the double dutch tournament who the fuck knows but they were like nope we need 30 minutes yeah 
Well, he's black, so he hasn't dealt any drugs yet in the movie. That's going to have to happen eventually, right? And this is this is the moment when I realized that like he had been selling the drugs because I thought, oh, you know, maybe his numbers were just off. And this is when they were like, oh no, he's been stealing and selling the drugs. That I mm-hmm. realized that the message of this movie was to tell young black women that their abusive drug dealer husbands would stop being abusive drug dealers. If they just prayed about it. Well, and shut right. up. And shut up. And shut up. Yes. And left <laughs> them alone. That's key, yes. Shut and up st- and pray, and your life, like, drug dealer, your drug dealing husband goes away, and he loves you again. And he doesn't, and he rubs your feet, and he fucking buys you ice cream and shit, and just all that's fucking horrible. And it all of a sudden, it just, that, in that moment, this movie crashed down on me, like, really yeah. hard. So during this scene, it was weird, because I was on a very different emotional plane than everyone else. So everyone else was like, oh, what's gonna happen? And I was just like, oh, what a horrible lie. What a horrible <laughs> lie. So I'm just over in the corner, rocking back and forth, being like, no, you gotta get out of those situations, man. Come on. <laughs> So then Tony brings the drugs that he still has that he hasn't sold yet back to um, poor man's Billy Bob Thornton and Alfred E. Newman's dad, and they they can't decide whether they want to prosecute him, so Sling Blade buys him a couple extra days while they think about it, (laughs) but he has to do it because, damn it, that's the right thing to do, and Jesus, Jesus. Right. So he does. The the bow tie character, Tony, I think his name is, Uh, the one who... Yeah, Tom, Tom, the, who's the bad guy? Yeah. Tom is right. And I just yes. want to take a, this movie plays Tom as like a meanie face, but he has committed <laughs> pharmaceutical fraud, which is a huge fucking deal. And no one in the movie ever acknowledges when Tom's like, oh no, he stole a bunch of drugs from a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. This puts all of us at risk. This put patients at risk this put everyone he sold the drugs to at risk well yes but i mean my thoughts are though like one of the things that a missing piece of information and maybe my uh brain was glazed over from uh the movie they never said what kind of drugs are they schedule one narcotics like what are we talking to about schedule two narcotics or are we talking about insulin i sell insulin to black people (laughs) because insulin's expensive and people are losing limbs like it was it, there could be like a, a robin hood effect but like what drugs is he selling <laughs> right and when he and when he opens it up it looks like little eye droppers so like what the fuck could that even be he does mention to the doctor that it's about the heart because he says <laughs> i read your paper about heart arrhythmia uh-huh. and i think you'd be interested in pranximac pragzimac or pregampin yeah <laughs> nobody's getting high on that so I'll get high on that. I grew up a white kid in the suburbs. Don't tell me how to live my journey. My people have been getting high on everything within a 45 mile radius since time began. And just right? getting away with it. I'm so sorry. You are right. It's so I need easy to for us. We can, we can ask the cop for a light. It's amazing. Our people put poop in jugs and smell it for fun, okay? <laughs> we can get high off anything, including Paraxapan. <laughs> so then we get another musical montage of them being a good Jesus-y family. And I only bring it up because, I mean, there's like five of these in the movie. But I bring this one up particularly because the name of the song that is playing in the background is Crazy Faith. And it sounds exactly like you think of songs called Crazy Faith Sounds. This is like this bumpkin country song playing over the top of this black family going to church. And they might tell me not to believe in Jesus, but fuck them. They're all a bunch of Jews. (laughs) Kill them. 9-11 was started by the Jews. Jet fuel doesn't burn that hot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, I mean, it it wasn't word for word. There were a couple of prepositions out of place, but otherwise it was acceptable. Yeah, well. <laughs> Other than that, he nailed it. Yeah. And then uh, Billy Bob Thornton comes to see him, and I guess he's so impressed that that Tony brought the drugs back that he decides not to prosecute. Oh, uh, right. Which is no, a crazy no, wait, no, moment. No, shut up. It's not a crazy moment, guys. <laughs> it's the magical white man moment. <laughs> I I was wrong. Uh. I'm sorry. This movie is magical. Thank you, magical white man, for saying it's okay. 
<laughs> give us back that money because you were giving out heart medicine to people. You know, selling heart medicine to people who probably have bad hearts and can't afford their drugs. So you steal samples so people can live. Stop it, black man. I'm magic. Listen to me. Uh, yeah. But I'm, and he, in this he says, I have never, I have never seen a man take total responsibility for his actions in the way you did. And I was like, never? Nobody? <laughs> That's <Right>. upsetting. <laughs> You've never met anyone who's like, oh, sorry, man, my bad. <laughs> Everyone in that man's life up until Tony has been like, nope, don't know who backed into you. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, and then he just poofs off into the distance. Just, oh, how much was stolen? $19,000 worth of life-saving heart medication. What are we going to do about it? Who the fuck knows? Doesn't who matter. cares? And oh. that is his I'm wife gonna. turns to him and says, Tony, that was God's grace. And I'm thinking, no, that was Billy Bob Thornton's stunt double. But sure, why the fuck not? Yeah, that's a miracle. Yeah, fuck fuck thin Rob Reiner, man. He comes in and he's like, I've, you know, I've really thought about this and I want to give you a second chance. And she's just like, thank you, God. And he's like, oh, actually, that was me. Thank you, God. <laughs> All right. I'll see myself out. And yes. indeed he does. Just wanders out into the night. I'm just saying, as far as White miracles squash. go, that ranks below the latest Toast appearance. And if you thought, hey, well, you know what? Now everything's been resolved. The movie can end. You were wrong. Because so it wrong. keeps going. <laughs> so wrong. Because now, now we get back to Miss Clara's house. Because if you'll remember, 875 minutes ago, we were selling her house. <laughs> yeah. Who knows why? Where we have two totally mystifying things happen. So... They come in to the house. She's showing this couple around. And the husband, who is a preacher, can smell that someone's been praying in the closet. <laughs> and he says, someone's been praying in this closet. <laughs> to which I wrote the Eli Bosnick story. <laughs> but the way we learn this is that he walks into the closet and then he backs out and walks in like nine fucking times. Yeah. Like a wind-up thing that... <laughs> Broke. Like he's sniffing around like a bloodhound, and the escaped fugitive walked in and out of this closet several times. Right, also. yes. Right. It smells like the prayer is baked in. That was the line he said. Yeah. I think prayer it's time for the baked. James Randi million dollar closet sniffing challenge for this guy. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> now, someone's been praying. Someone has prayed in one of these eight closets, and if you could tell us 14 times in a row on stage while, while Jamie and Swish stares at you, then you'll get a million dollars. <laughs> But if you can't, we're gonna we're gonna videotape it, put it on the internet, make fun of your ass. I didn't come out until I was 1995. <laughs> That's a problem. We should all acknowledge. I want to know because I'm curious about all of you. What is baked in prayer smell <laughs> like? What does that smell <laughs> like? Probably chicken. Uh, bad feet, perhaps. Yeah, I'm gonna go with it. It smells like tears. Like if you've ever if you've ever cried into your own mouth over and over again, <laughs> like a crazy. <laughs> Deep sea HP Lovecraftian nightmare monster. It's probably what the inside of that monster's mouth smells like. Yes, <laughs> I, I was I was Got about it. to say okay. the same thing, but Eli beat me to it. Yeah, we finish each other's sentences <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and then, of course, we have to get the obligatory scene where Elizabeth thanks Miss Clara for being all intrusive and Jesusy. And this is a key scene in every Christian movie because they have to send the message, no, I know it seems like you're just annoying the fuck out of them, but eventually they'll thank you. Right. Well, but that's how you get a husband in these movies. <laughs> uh, it's so, how you keep of one, course. too. Yeah. Stop annoying me. Stop annoying me. Fine, I'll marry you. Now it's... <laughs> Not legally rape in some states. Oh, All right. Wow. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be real. It's not legally rape in all states. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There's a huge not culture. Not under God's law. <laughs> exactly. We allow that kind of thing to happen all the time. Am I right? Am I right? Um, unfortunately, oh. yes, you are right. So. <sighs> so then they go to the double dust <laughs> tournament. Yes. They, do, they jump a rope. Well, but now a along the way, they have to come across... Uh, Alfred E. Newman's dad again, and his his car is broke. His, his car's not even broken down. The guy's got a flat fucking tire, and he's got a spare tire and a jack there. This is the mean guy who looks like a snitch from Doctor Seuss, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Orville Redenbacher's illegitimate son is over here, and he can't. And he's talking on his phone. He's like, "Well, God damn it, who's going to change this fucking tire that I have sitting right here next to this jack?" And uh, and Tony shows up and changes it for him. So yes, this movie has now become. 
an LDS commercial. But he changes it in silence. Like, no <laughs> words are exchanged. Yeah. <laughs> he changes it in silence. And, like, the whole time, I'm just like, someone talk. <laughs> someone say something. Hey, man, thanks for... Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I Don't just wanted it. to... Shh. Don't ruin it. <laughs> it was horrifying. Also, there was that terrifying moment where he pulls the tire iron out of the back yes. of his car. And I was like, is this movie going to have Tony, like... Beat up the guy who wanted to prosecute him for pharmaceutical fraud. Is that? Are we going to get? Is that our denouement for this character? Is him being assaulted to sleep on the side of a road? Again, would have made a much better movie, but no, he just changes the tire, and then we get along to the uh, to the double Dutch meet, which apparently is one of those. You know how we have those athletic competitions. Where grown fucking men compete against eight-year-old girls? It's See, one of those. It starts with Caitlyn Jenner, and now full-grown <laughs> men can compete with eight-year-old girls. They were right. Mike Huckabee was right. Oh, I feel like an eight-year-old girl. And now Tony the Adonis is just creaming his way across the double Dutch circuit. We were warned. We were warned. <laughs> And now we get the uh, the money shot of the movie, I guess, which is uh, Tony doing sort of a side flippy thing into the jump ropes, which they they break it down into slow motion. And I just want to point out that he actually didn't get it because the way that you're supposed to do this is to fall, you know, into the jump rope while the jump rope is still going. But he couldn't do that, so they didn't do that. They just had him do a flip that had nothing to do with anything, and then start doing jump rope next to a jump rope. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of weird. <laughs> Right, just someone doing a backflip next to the jump rope. Also, they this was really mediocre double dutch. I, I, apparently, I'm told that double dutch can be incredibly impressive. <laughs> this was not. If you have fat kids doing the stunts in your double dutch movie, it's yeah. not going well. There was a kid there who was like my weight, who just like had sweat pouring down his face and like half a <laughs> Cheeto sticking out of his mouth. That you've not brought your double dutch A game if one of your kids is like, huh, 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 they didn't say we were going to be jumping rope. Huh, 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 huh. <laughs> I, I mean, there was a certain point I was like, where are the defibrillators on this? Like, right. it's, like, where's the safety? Come on. These people are not athletically prone. By the way, citywide like, double dutch tournament filled, filled with people. 850,000 yes. people watching this citywide <laughs> double dutch tournament. I did not know that double dutch tournaments existed. I wasn't 100% sure on what double dutch was until I saw someone doing it, but apparently a citywide tournament outsells the LCS Eastern Cup finals. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Also, like why is he competing? Like in right? the sense like it's the thing that I kept coming back to where I was like Nobody's thinking, A, most of the double Dutch teams leaned white. Why is this very muscular black man <laughs> scaring our judges? I want to see those kids on the bus ride home who yeah, got third right. place just being like, so that was weird, right, with that other team? <laughs> Why? What was weird about it? Oh, you know, the, the, they had that like really full-grown, muscular athlete grown up. <laughs> On their team, like, uh, Adonis, he was he, and, he was Adonis. But there were also some eight-year-old girls on the team, so it, it was perfectly natural. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and we all know girls are stupid. So stupid. Get your period, stinky. <laughs> Gross. Wash your feet. Dress up for the mailman. <laughs> and now the movie's over, right? Nope. No. 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 We need the we need the rise up my lesion section yes. of this, which is. Let me tell you, the ending of this movie, which is, I think, maybe somewhat happy for the people who were watching it, is the beginning of a scary movie for me. Right. Because her last <laughs> monologue, she's just like, bring up the third. You can listen to the, mo I'm not going to do it. But she does the whole thing. And then we have a picture of a guy reading a Bible on a tractor, uh -huh. a school full of Christians, Christian cop. Yep. A Christian. An on-duty Christian cop. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> An on-duty Christian cop, a Christian baby, prayer in a classroom, and then what I can only assume is the anti Antichrist blocking out the sun with clouds of blood. 
because the final <laughs> shot of this movie is just a white man with his hand held out as the sun descends into a sea of blood. Now, <laughs> now I, I, I want to point this out because this was just so bizarre to me, okay? This movie ends with, you know, prayer in school and people just crowding. The, 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 the churches are so packed because all the people are going in and praying. This movie actually quotes Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Here it is for you if, you if you're not familiar. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. This movie quotes that line. That's why the lady's in her closet praying. And at the end of this fucking movie, they show the public hypocrite praying massage. What the everlasting fuck? They've, they've, they, they, like, they don't, they're not, they're not even watching their own movie. To be fair, those people are not praying at the end of the movie. They're gearing up to kill all the Jews and all the Muslims. <laughs> oh, oh. They're, they're, they're just closing their eyes to sort of catch their breath. I don't know if you're – like when you're super setting and you got to get that last 15 reps in, that's just their – they've all got guns and knives just out of frame. That cop's going to go murder someone. That's, <laughs> it you all just clicked that with scene. me. It just clicked with me. I get it now. Yeah, and now and now the movie has closure. Oh, so good. <laughs> Finally. So I have a two part question for everybody. Uh what were we supposed to learn from this movie and or what did we learn from this movie? Well, me is women be loving closets. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna settle for humor in this movie. So they've done cop sitting at a kitchen table. Fireman sitting at a kitchen table, football coach sitting at a kitchen table, and real estate agent sitting at a kitchen table. So what do you think is up next for the Kendrick brothers? What would you like to see out of them now? Maybe maybe move on to a, to a breakfast nook or something, try something different? So, I mean, they've taken on all of the heroic professions now, and they're slowly moving down the line. So I think the next movie we should see from them should be Rabbi sitting at a kitchen table. I, now, oh, hear me shit. out. Here's, here's what it is. It's, this is a movie, right, but written by the Kendrick brothers about a Jewish couple. All right? <laughs> and her name, her name is Esther. Uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh -huh. And her husband's name is Moishi. And Moishi <laughs> dropped a penny in the street 44 years ago. And he's never home because he's always searching for it. But she realizes that she's unclean when she goes on her period. So she starts bathing herself in water and leaving the town for the time that she's on her period. And when she does that, her husband comes home and shaves off his beard and wears clothes that aren't black all the time and does some sit-ups and loves her. And their three inbred, super skinny, can't behave in toy store children all learn to behave and get a, a real education from a public school instead of a crazy secret Hebrew school education <laughs> where they only learn how to read pages out of a spell book. <laughs> and it's called Jew Fly Don't Bother Me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I hope they watched the summer 2016. Of Fantastic. <laughs> So, Keisha, we try to steer clear of thumbs up, thumbs down type cliches. So rather than asking you how many stars you would give this movie or anything like that, I'm going to ask you this. What is the dullest implement that you could chop one of your own fingers off with while still having more fun than you had watching this movie? No, not to get meta with it. Uh, the dullest thing, and it's not dull, but I would take the feminine mystique and... As a book, I would begin sawing off my limb <laughs> because uh, clearly w women need uh, to know their place <laughs> and only through female mutilation uh, with feminist uh, tools will I truly understand that uh, feminism is the reason I'm bleeding out slowly. <laughs> You have no one to blame but yourself. That's what happened to Charlize Theron and Mad Max. It makes so much sense now. I, I mean, I, I want to just take this moment in the podcast to apologize for being so uppity. And <laughs> I, all this speaking Let her in talk, guys. Let her talk. Doing... Go ahead. Go ahead. Get it out. No, I'm sorry. I've done too much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I have to go serve my husband. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm going to go beat up my girlfriend with a Bell Hooks collection. 
<laughs> please, please do, please do. Um, it's uh, for her. It's for her. <laughs> well, she has to know that intersectionality is just as terrible too. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, well, it's like when you're like two things. Oh God, I've said too much. Oh, so boring. Oh, you can't so teach boring. a man something now. That's against the Bible too. I read me some Timothy today. I'm all fired up. All right, now Heath, I want to give you kind of the same question. I'm going to switch it around though. All right. What is the sharpest implement? that you could insert into one of your orifices while having more fun than you had watching War Room, and please specify the orifice. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll say uh, a trombone tuned at A445. That's pretty sharp. Covered in aluminum foil and shoved into my root canal area that just got <laughs> opened up. Oh, Sounds like fun. That's a good one. And finally, Eli, what is the most uncomfortable conversation that you would rather have with your mother than give War Room another viewing? I would rather my mother accidentally attend a performance of me in blackface and then <laughs> and then that backstage conversation where she's like, you said you were in a show, but you didn't say this. I would rather that than this because basically that's what I did to Keisha. What I did to right. Keisha is I brought her to a blackface show I was in and I was like, you want to talk about it afterwards? So Keisha... From all of us here at the God Awful Movies podcast, our, our deepest, deepest We're apologies. So very sorry. Yes. So terribly, terribly sorry. <laughs> well, thank you for. I, I mean, this has been a journey. So I want to thank you for showing me a, a movie that shows me why, why everything I've been doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important. That's important. That yeah. now I know my place. Um, Good. Good. I'm gonna go service my husband right now and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, America. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you for thank you, white men, for teaching me how to be the black woman I I should be. Um, if I had a nickel. <laughs> um. So, Keisha, if our listeners wanted to hear more from you or see more of you, where should they go? Um, so I have a podcast called The Soul Globe po Project. Uh, it's different in tone. It's about, um, it's about, I'm, I'm sorry guys, it's about celebrating diversity and comedy. <gasps> Boo! I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Boo! I, John Stewart was the best! <laughs> Wait, sorry, I heard. I yeah, heard diversity. I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I'm wrong. It's stupid. Uh, so, I mean, you could go to the soul, soul project dot com. No W. Um, you can also, uh, find me doing shows all over New York. Um, I have a web series called in game. That is pretty funny. It's about, uh, live action role players. Um, awesome. and you can go to in game, the series dot com and find that there. And, um, yeah, KeishaZoller.com. I like put stuff there. Not all the time, but like sometimes. So like do that. Awesome. And of course, we'll have all of that linked in the description box for this show. Thank you one more time for joining us tonight. Thank you. And of course, that does it for our review of War Room. But that's not going to do it for the show just yet. Because before we close it out, we're going to dedicate a few minutes to our next cinematic stillbirth. So Eli, what's on deck? The original... Kirk Cameron starring Left Behind, the movie. Finally some Kirk Cameron. I know, I've missed him. <laughs> now, it's worth noting that we already watched the remake of this one with Nicolas Cage, so we're actually going to be watching a movie that is so bad, they upgraded it by adding Nick Cage. Yeah, exactly. You know you know that this is a bad movie when they were like, oh, what can make this movie better? I don't know, what about the crazy guy from Bad Lieutenant? Yeah, yeah. him. <laughs> Let's throw him in there. You know what's not, you know what was, what's not crazy enough? This movie. No kidding. Now, I will say though, based on the preview, this one looks a hell of a lot more explodey. Yeah, exactly. This movie looks like it's trying to trick you into thinking it's not a religious movie. It's very much like, if you were to tell me that this wasn't based on Left Behind, but this was just called The Missing, I'd be mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know, looks okay. Looks okay. Yeah. Like, at, at every point in this preview, it just seems like it's going to be about searching for missing people. You get a smidgen of Jesus with the black guy being like, I knew your word. Right. But I don't know. I don't know. That could just be like aliens or something. I feel yeah. like I've, I would have walked into this movie in the 80s and been like, I hear it's really good. They're trying to figure out where, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> now, can you believe this movie was made in 2000? 
Oh, no. Yeah, it that's, sure looks like 80s from the preview. That's so dis- – every Christian movie we see looks like it was made 50 years before <laughs> it was made. Well, not only that, but also the the attitudes that are being expressed seems about, uh, about 50 years out of date, too. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'll tell you what. I think, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in virtually every scene they show in the preview, Kirk Cameron is on screen. Like, even if he's just standing next to whoever's talking on the preview, it's like they really want to reinforce, there's someone in this that you recognize. Yeah, this is also OG crazy Kirk Cameron, so I definitely recommend it. Now he sort of looks like a strung-out meth addict. Like, oh, okay, meth's been with him for a while. But this is like... If you ever had a buddy who had a coke problem, this is like very early on in the coke uh-huh. problem where you're like, I don't know, he seems like he's got a lot of energy, he's doing really well, he's dating that girl now. This is that phase before we see religion turn Kirk Cameron into Smeagol. This is where we get to see him where he's just like, oh, I guess he went crazy, but it, maybe it's not hurting him. And I, I hope as we watch these three movies to watch him go further and further down the rabbit hole of madness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The beginning of the end. And yes, that's right. We're doing the whole fucking trilogy. Three straight weeks of Kirk Cameron and the atheists say there's no hell. Witness me! <laughs> So with that to look forward to, we'll bring the episode to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Keisha Zeller for joining us tonight, and an enormous thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to every episode. You can also help us a ton by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed the show, be sure to check out our sibling show, The Scathing Atheist and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars and was used with permission. If you like what you hear, you can hear more by following the link on the show notes to this episode. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm no illusion, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a guy from Brooklyn telling you to fuck yourself. Fuck you.